In Proverbs chapter 24 tonight, uh, I just want to read one verse. We covered verses 1 through 9 last Wednesday night, and we titled that, In the Not Sinners. And I want to take verses, uh, t- verse 10 rather, tonight. Next week we'll be in verse 11 and 12. Notice with me verse 10, I'm just going to title this, Fainting and Adversity. And uh, this is a message to me, probably more so than to you. But notice as we come here in this one verse, he said, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this privilege again as we assemble together here tonight. We pray, Lord, for your blessings uh, to be upon us. We pray, Lord, for thy will to be done. We pray, Lord, that you would help us with this verse and lead and guide us. We ask all of these things in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. We see here clearly that adversity tries our strength, uh, tries our faith. One writer put it this way, he said, We cannot choose our circumstances, but we can choose our response in our circumstances. We really find out uh, sometimes what we're made of uh, in adversity. And uh, he says again, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. And one writer said you can measure a man by what it takes to stop him. Uh, And and that's so true. And what our text is doing is speaking of the reality of adversity. Notice he begins with the word if. In other words, it's possible, very probable. In other words, God recognizes the reality of our fainting. In other words, he says, if thou faint in the day of adversity. And so we find that our, t- our faith will be tested and adversity will come one way or another, you know, in our life. And I, we're going to mainly talk about spiritual fainting. I mean, we could, we could cover the physical and the spiritual aspects of it. But, uh, the word faint here in our passage, we all know what that means to become disheartened, uh, to be cast down, to be weary. There's many synonyms that can be used to give up, to quit to fail, to become discouraged to the point that it hinders our walk, uh, to drop out, to fall out, uh, to despair. I mean, there's a multitude of synonyms that we could use. I remember going through basic training uh, back in 1971 in Orlando, Florida, on the parade field, a lot of getting up way before daylight and working, training way into the night, but on the parade field, about 100 degrees in August, and uh, we'd uh, go through a lot of training and marching and all that kind of stuff, and then stand sometimes an hour or two at parade rest. And occasionally you'd see a person just fall out. They would just uh, pass out and hit the pavement, and they'd come and carry them off to sick bay, and that, that happened from time to time. That's sort of what this is talking about, is fainting spells. And uh, notice he speaks here uh, also uh, of this subject of adversity. Verse 10 again, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. In other words, he, when he speaks of thy strength is small, uh, speaks of our weakness and our narrow view of God. In other words, they, adversity will try our strength. They will try our faith and life, life's pressures will show our strengths and also our weaknesses as they come along. Now, I want to read this one more time. We're going to turn away from it. But he said here, verse 10 again, uh, get this kind of in our minds and hearts. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Notice with me as we turn to chapter 3, and I'll read a few verses on chastisement. We're not going to preach a whole message on that. We've got one entire message here in Proverbs and also others at different times. But notice in chapter 3, I'm going to read two verses, just two verses here. And again, um, when we talk about adversity, that speaks of troubles, trials, tribulations, temptations, afflictions, um, uh, to be compressed, to have pressure put on us. And, and again, these things happen in, in life. But he says here in chapter 3, verse 11 to 12, and I'm reading these verses that uh, 
not all of it just comes from the world and the devil. God will allow adversity to come into our life, not to hurt us, but, but to help us. No man or woman escapes it. It's a, it's a fact of life. And it is actually a gift to us in many ways. It, it is a gift because it will, it will bring us uh, closer to the Lord. He says here in verse 11 and 12, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. Notice the word weary here, connected with the word faint. And he said in verse 12, For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. Notice with me in the book of Deuteronomy, and we'll be reading in chapter 8, just a few verses out of this chapter. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And when we come to this passage, we clearly see that, that uh, adversities and trials and so forth, uh, many of them are ordained of God to keep us close to Him and to correct us when we need correction. Notice in chapter 8, he speaks in verse 1 of keeping God's commandments. In verse 2, he says, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, and here's the reason, to humble thee, to prove thee, that is to test them. Now God will never test us, tempt us to sin. Uh, we see that in the book of James. He will never do that. But he will test us, as in uh, verse uh, 2. You also see that again in verse 16. But he says in here, to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what uh, was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Verse 3, and he humbled thee and suffered, that is, allowed thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee known, know rather, that man doth not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord do, doeth man live. He speaks of their raiment in verse 4, but notice in verse 5, he says, Thou shalt also consider in thy heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore, verse 6, Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. In other words, they're going into the land of promise. We read about the goodness of that land in verses 7 through 10, and then there's warning in verse 11 through the end of the chapter. And he's just warning them not to forget the Lord and forget His commandments. But again, as we look at verse 2 and 3, God led them in the wilderness to humble them, to prove them and to know what was in their hearts, whether they would keep His commandments or not. And so we see here again the doctrine of chastisement in verse 5. Notice with me as we come to the book of Hebrews, in chapter 12. We turned here and read just a few verses in our series uh, in Second Timothy on Sunday night a few weeks ago, um, dealing with the running of the race. But notice, I want to just come and begin reading in verse 2 uh, here tonight. And notice here, he said in verse 2, he said, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And he said in verse 3, For consider him that endured such contradiction, that is, opposition, and he says, such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So we can have fainting spells. We can become weary. And so he tells us in this passage, verse 2 and 3, to look unto the Lord Jesus. In other words, he endured the cross, despising the shame that, that was set uh, before him, and uh, and he did all of this with joy. There was hardship and afflictions in the Lord's earthly ministry, and as he went to the cross after the trial, and uh, but we are to look unto him that we do not faint and that we do not become discouraged and become weary. And also he reminds them, as you come to verse 5, and he remind, reminds them, as we just read in 
Proverbs 3 and Deuteronomy 8, uh, that the Lord's chastisement is upon us, always for our good. He said in verse 5, he said, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. He said, My son, despise not thou the chasing of the Lord, here's that word again, and faint, nor faint when thou rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? And he comes, he continues talking about this and the importance of it. And he uses the fact that as a father would chasten his son, God will chasten us as his children. But as we come down to verse uh, 10 and 11, he said, For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, talking about a father. But he, uh, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. That's the reason that God does this in verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous, ne nevertheless, Afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So we find that the end result of it is that it produces holiness and it brings or yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. If we could always see that, we don't sometimes because we don't enjoy chastening. We don't enjoy adversity and thing, things like that that come into our life. But here's the result of it if we respond to it in a proper way. All will go through adversity. And the issue is, is that again, as we read the quote a moment ago, is how we respond in those circumstances. Notice in chapter uh, 13, well, notice first of all, let me back up to chapter 10. Hebrews 10, then we'll go to chapter 13. Now, it's interesting that uh, as the apostle is writing this, in chapter 12, uh, they were told to consider him, to consider the Lord Jesus, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Now, he's writing to those, encouraging them to continue to look unto the Lord, that they not become weary and faint in their minds. But I want you to notice in chapter 10, the things that they've already went through and, uh, and, and endured through them joyfully. Notice as we begin reading uh, in verse uh, 32. Notice in verse 32. He says here in this passage, he says, But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of affliction, partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst you became companions of them that were so used. And we read about those as in chapter 11, especially verse uh, 35 uh, through verse 40. But he goes on to say in verse 34, For ye had compassion of me and my bonds. The writer's speaking of his imprisonment. So, and he says, notice in verse 34, And took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. So he's writing to those who are going through these things, and they have overcome in many things, but still yet, as he continues through the letter, he's encouraging them not to quit, not to faint, not to become weary, but to keep their eyes on the Lord Jesus. And then he says this in verse 35 through 39, "'Casting not away therefore your confidence,' that is your faith, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we, speaking of true Christians, but we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So he's commending them 
for the things that they've overcome in and been through, but he's also encouraging them in chapter 12 to not become weary and faint, but to keep their eyes on the Lord Jesus. Notice in chapter 13. In chapter 13, and just one verse, notice in verse 3. He says this, he said, Remember them that are in bonds. In other words, those that are in prison, as we read in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 31, the sheep and the goats are compared there. And, but uh, he says here, he says, Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. Now I think about that. Well, let me read the whole verse. He said, And them which suffer adversity, as being yourself also in the body. And I don't think that necessarily means the body of Christ, because he says, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. In other words, as if you're a part of them and suffering with them. In other words, you, if you just imagine in your mind being in their position, it'll sure help us to pray for them more. And then he says, as being yourselves also in the body. In other words, uh, in other words, just uh, put yourself in their place and imagine what they're going through. They're suffering adversity, and in other words, really get this in our hearts and minds as we pray for others. What they are truly going through—that's the ideal here. Notice while we're here, close James chapter one, and James chapter one, and as we as we think about this. Uh, Passages like in Psalms 42, the whole chapter is great, and, and someone seeking the Lord, but in verse 5 and 6, and then also in verse 11, he says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? We do get cast down sometimes. And we see many of the saints uh, throughout the Bible that went through these things. The Apostle Paul writing, in 2 Corinthians 4, 1, he said, We faint not because of the Lord's help. I'm putting some of that in my own words. But he said the only real thing that keeps us from fainting is that the Lord uh, lifts us up and helps us. Ecclesiastes seven fourteen also deals with this as well. The good times and the bad times. They're going to come whether a person is saved or lost. That it's going to be that way. Well, here in, in, in this passage we just read, again, we are to uh, be sensitive toward those who are going through adversity. Notice in James chapter 1, uh, the first uh, few verses, and then we'll drop down to verse 12. He said in verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting... My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith, what does it work? Patience. And he says, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect, that is mature, perfect and entire wanting, that is lacking nothing. Verse 12, blessed is the man that endure temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So we will go through temptations, trials, adversity, and, uh, and so the Lord has told us how to respond to that. Notice as we come to 1 Peter in chapter 4. In 1 Peter in chapter 4. I want to begin reading in verse 12. Now I've mentioned this to you, especially when we talk through First Peter and Second Peter, and we find that in every chapter of First Peter, he mentions to those he's writing to about suffering for Christ. Uh, you'll find that uh, in chapter one and verse six and seven, he speaks of the manifold temptations and the trying of their faith, um, and also in chapter. 2 verse 20 and 21 he speaks again of suffering with patience and he also said in verse 21 in reference to the Lord Jesus he said for even here two were ye called that is in called to suffer because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps we find it in chapter 3 and verse 14 
chapter 4, we're going to read in just a moment, verses 12 through uh, about verse 16. And then in chapter 5, he's speaking of humility, being clothed with humility in verse 5 and 6. But he also tells us that we have an enemy, uh, the, the devil. Uh, he's, um, he's our adversary. He says a roaring lion. But he said in verse 10, he says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make, your, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. In other words, every chapter brings in the thought of adversities and afflictions and sufferings for Christ's sake, the opposition that the Christian will have. Now notice in chapter 4, and in verse uh, 12, I used to tell you often, I have said it a long time, I was telling Brother Lavelle this uh, Sunday night, used to say that we probably ought to, when we witness to people, and before we pray with them and they receive Christ as a Savior, we ought to say, go ahead, let me tell you what we're signing up for. Let me tell you what you're enlisting in, and so you can make that decision where you really want to trust the Lord or not. Well, notice in verse 12, he said here, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Now, many times we do think it's strange. We say, why is this going on in my life? And when he says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials. In other words, those fiery trials, we don't like them, but they purify us. And he's saying, don't be surprised. Uh, he's saying, uh, don't let it shock us. But we do sometimes, don't we? Yeah. Say, well, why in the world is this happening to me? So he goes on to say in verse 13, but rejoice in as much as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. He continues in verse 14 through 16, speaking of the things that a Christian will go through. Well, I'm going to read two other passages and give you just a few more, but I want you to turn with me to 1 Kings 19. In 1 Kings chapter 19, some of the other passages that I'll mention and will not turn to, one is Job. As you read through the book of Job, chapter 1 and 2, you see all that came into his life, and he's praising God in his sufferings. But as you get into chapter 2 and 3 and 4, you'll find that Job has made statements such as he just wished it had never been born. He's going through it. The reality of it sets in. And then as we get to the end of the book, chapter 42, it actually begins about chapter 38. God just sets him down and just asks him a lot of questions. In other words, where were you when I created everything, putting it on my own words? By the time the Lord got through with him, Job repented. Now, Job wasn't living in gross sin. That wasn't why those bad things come upon him. Job was a righteous man, but he, he was troubled with the adversity that he was going through. But when you read in chapter 42, beginning in verse 1, you'll find that he repented. He said, now I understand, and, uh, and the Lord restored twice as much to him as he had before. So, yes, Job asked questions. Uh, and as we will ask questions. And there was some discouragement there with Job. Uh, also, in 1 Samuel, I'll just give you the one verse, 1 Samuel 36, 30, chapter 30, verse 6. You'll find that David and his men had came back to the city of Ziglag, and the enemy had burned the city, and had taken their wives and their children, taken everything that they had into captivity. And in the verse I just gave you, in the surrounding context, the, the men, everybody was discouraged. The Bible says that David was greatly distressed, and, and the men were distressed. They were discouraged. They even wanted his own army, his own friends. They wanted to stone David. David. 
They blamed David. And so David was distressed, but what did he do? He encouraged himself in the Lord. And he went to prayer, the high priest, he went to prayer, and he asked the Lord what to do. And the Lord says, none of them will be harmed. Not one of their families was harmed. And God told David to pursue them. And they pursued them and destroyed the enemy and brought their families uh, back. And so that's another example. Again, David was greatly distressed. And he turned to the Lord. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Even his friends and army wanted to stone him. Um, another example is Jonah. It's easy to read through the book. I just sat down and read through it all this morning again to remind myself of what was there. And we've talked through that book many years ago in a verse-by-verse -verse setting. We know that Jonah uh, went down to Joppa. He was, you know, he left the will of God there for a while. You know the story, with the, you know, the fish, the whale, and so forth. But you also find in chapter 4, after they, he went through the city and preached, the city of Nineveh. He went through that city. He's preaching in chapter uh, 2 uh, or 3. When you get to the last chapter, uh, he's discouraged. He wasn't, I mean, he had one of the greatest evangelistic campaigns anyone could ever have, but he wasn't excited about the whole city, you know, repenting and turning to the Lord. And I've, I've looked into that. Why was this so? Some believe that, that he felt like that if they had repented, God, you know, they would be used to even destroy the nation of Israel for their sin. Don't know exactly all the details there. But what we find in chapter 4, verses 3 and verses 8, we find that he, he fainted and he wished that he could die. Build him a little shelter, and the Lord let a gourd to grow up, the big leaves, the shade, shrub over that, and then the Lord took that away. And he, he was just extremely discouraged as you come to the last chapter of that book. He fainted. Well, notice as we come to 1 Kings chapter 19, we'll read a few verses here, and we'll go to Jeremiah 12 and close. But we see, as we come through the Scripture, the benefits of adversity. That doesn't mean that we like it and that we want it. We surely don't pray for it, do we? And, uh, but the benefits of adversity, it allows us and gives us the opportunity and time to reflect upon our Creator. Most of the time, I'm going to say all the time, but most of the time in prosperity, we don't think of God as much. Well, notice as we come here, one verse we'll not turn to is Luke twenty-one twenty-six. men's hearts failing them for fear, looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Their hearts are failing them because of the fear. 2 Timothy 3, 1 speaks of perilous times, you know, that will come. Well, notice in 1 Kings, we find in verse 19, now if you read through chapter 18, we find that Elijah has had a great victory. And this is where that he stood against the uh, 450, I think it was, uh, prophets of Baal. And you remember that Elijah not only built the sacrifice, poured water upon it and, and drenched it, and fire came down out of heaven and, and uh, honored um, Elijah's sacrifice and his faith. And uh, verse 38, with fire of the Lord fell. Verse uh, 39 through 40, Elijah has all these false prophets killed. Some great things that he had done, the Lord had done through him. But Jezebel... In chapter 19, verse 1, 2, and 3, she basically said she's going to have Elijah killed. And here's what he did in verse chapter 19, verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey in the wilderness and came and sat under a juniper tree. 
and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Angel comes and ministers to him, gives him strength. As you read there, he went 40 days and 40 nights in verse 8. He came to a cave, and the Lord came to him. In verse 9, the latter part, What doest thou here, Elijah? Of course, Elijah said in verse 10, and this is so, he, he loved the Lord. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with a sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it. In other words, he says that he's just ready to die. He's through with all of this, and he's discouraged. There's a fainting spell here in his life. We're not saying this to criticize him because we've all, we've all been there. What the Lord did, and I'm, I'm skipping several verses, but what the Lord did as we come to verse 11 and 12, 13, and he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains." and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still, small voice. Elijah was used to exciting things. He brought fire down out of heaven, but the Lord came to him in a still, small voice, and in verse 13, and it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in a mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? He repeats himself as in verse 10. But as you read through the rest of the chapter, the Lord said unto Elijah, he said, I'm not through with you. And he's going to go and anoint the king of Assyria in verse 15. He's going to anoint a king over Israel. And he's going to also uh, anoint the prophet that would take his place, which is Elisha. And so, but he became discouraged here. Lord ministered to him, had an angel to go to him. Then the Lord met with him and spoke to him here in this cave to encourage him, and he is encouraged, and he goes about his journey and finishes what God has called him to do. One other passage that we'll look at, and that will be Jeremiah. I'm only going to read one verse in Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah brings complaint about the wicked, and uh, there were those that were wicked in his nation. In verse 5, God answers Jeremiah in regard to his present challenges. But the Lord speaks that there would be greater challenges even in the future. He would also be put in a dungeon, be put in prison. There was going to be some greater challenges that would come unto him. In other words, his sufferings have just begun, really, as we start into this chapter. I know this is encouraging to you tonight. And um, in other words, if we get wearied in little things, how shall we handle bigger things is the thought here in the passage. Notice in verse 5, he said, If thou hast run with a footman, and, thou art, and, and they have wearied thee, then how can thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace, wherein thou trustest, they weary thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? In other words, the overflowing floods of Jordan. In other words, if you can't stay with a footman, how are you going to stay with the horses? And so he's just he's in, he's encouraging. Jeremiah here, because Jeremiah, we know as a prophet to the nation before the captivity, the Babylonian captivity, with not seeing 
a lot of converts. He's called the weeping prophet, you know, and um, and so he's he's gonna he's got the dungeon let down in a hole, a prison, all these things that are coming, and the Lord is saying these things to encourage him. Would you stand with me, please? Father, we do thank you for this day and this week that you've given us. We thank you for your love and mercy to us. We thank you that when we do faint and that we become weary, Lord, that you will minister to us, you will speak to us, you will lift us up, that you will help us. Father, we thank you for that. Lord, now we ask your blessings upon the remaining of the service. For it's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.